The fallout from Bernard Madoff's alleged $50 billion fraud has sent shockwaves around the globe. Just how did the scandal happen? And why did regulating bodies fail to catch what could be the biggest financial scandal in history? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Marianne Namazi. A $50 billion fraud, the latest blow to the financial world and one of Wall Street's biggest scandals. Bernard Madoff faces allegations that his entire business was nothing more than a scheme to dupe investors. On paper, Madoff's asset management businesses had $17 billion and around 20 major clients. But investigations reveal that it could be as much as $50 billion. And whether this money has been spent, stashed, or simply lost on the markets is yet to emerge. His clients, and now the victims of the scan, include pensioners, banks, charities, filmmakers, high-profile private investors. Some of the names that have surfaced are HSBC, Man Group in the UK, Spanish Group Banco Satanda, Yeshiva University, the pension fund for an entire town in Connecticut, Tokyo's Nomura Holdings and charities of film director Steven Spielberg, a Nobel laureate and Holocaust survivor, Elie Wiesel. Well, the list of his clients is diverse and spread across the world. So what made this man so appealing from Tokyo to Paris? And what made him so credible? Well, for nearly half a century, Madoff was credited to be a pillar of the Wall Street community. At the age of 22, he founded his firm, Bernard L. Madoff Investment, with just $5,000, which he made by working as a lifeguard and installing garden sprinklers. He soon rose through the ranks of Wall Street, becoming the chairman of the Nasdaq Stock Exchange in 1990. He advised American authorities on how to regulate markets. Year after year, his company consistently reported moderately high returns. His clientele was strictly by invitation only. Being rich was not enough in itself. This created an air of exclusivity. Clients were predominantly recruited through his social network. So how did he become as rich as he did? Well, Madoff was allegedly running the world's largest pyramid scheme and a particular type of it, a so-called Ponzi scheme. Now, it's named after a legendary Italian swindler based on exploiting the desire for making money quickly and easily. Ponzi schemes offer extraordinarily high short-term returns, but these returns are paid with the money from new investors, not from real profits. As long as new investors buy in, the old investors will see a profit. But eventually the pyramid becomes too large and the scheme collapses, or it's discovered by authorities and dismantled, something that Bernard Madoff himself said was inevitable. It's virtually impossible to, to violate rules. And this is something that the public really doesn't understand. And you, if you read things in the newspaper and you see somebody you know, violate a rule, you say, well, you know, they're always doing this. But you, it's impossible for you to go under, for a violation to go undetected. Certainly not for a, a considerable period of time. Well, joining us now are our guests in Stamford, Connecticut, Peter Schiff. He's the CEO of Euro Pacific Capital. In Skopje, Sam Vankin, former senior business correspondent for United Press International and a former economic advisor to the Macedonian, Czech, Yugoslavian and Serb governments. And in London, Margie Lindsay, editor of the Hedge Fund Review. Thank you for joining us. Peter Schiff, if I can come to you first, I suppose a question that everyone seems to be asking right now is how he was able to get away with it. I don't think anybody knows how he was able to pull that off, why the regulators didn't catch it. But I think what it, what it helps prove is something I've been saying for a long time. You know, I run a small uh, brokerage firm in the United States. We're heavily regulated. And I've always thought that the SEC and FINRA do much more harm than good when it comes to investors. Because I think the regulators end up being captured by the larger firms that they regulate. And they generally act as barriers to entry, keeping out smaller players, you know, complying with all these rules and regulations that I don't even and think really benefits the public. What it does is it makes it expensive for independent firms to get started because the larger firms can afford to comply with all this regulation. But in the end, I think investors are worse off. Look at all the dot-com scandals. Look at all the subprime mortgages. And look at Madoff. All this stuff happened right under the nose of the SEC and under FINRA. Investors are getting wiped out. What are we getting for all this government re regulation? We're not getting anything. So Margie Lindsay, let me put that to you. The Securities and Exchange Commission Chairman Christopher Cox 
said that he is, quote, gravely concerned about the apparent multiple failures by his staff to look into credible and specific allegations about Madoff's business. I mean, that's quite a remarkable declaration, is it? How much responsibility should the SEC take for what has happened? I, I think it should be a mutually beneficial um, taking the blame on this one. I think the investors also had a role to play in this. They should have been having much deeper due diligence and paying much more attention to what was going on and asking Madoff to have um, separate front office and back office independent valuations. The SEC itself should have certainly picked this up a lot sooner. And I'm not sure if it's because they don't have enough resources or if they're just um, bemused and bedazzled by someone of that standing and they don't dig as deep as they should. Sam Vankin, what's your opinion? Why didn't the SEC uh, pick up on this sooner? Why didn't uh, the numerous complaints that were made about Madoff set alarm bells ringing? Well, to go on a limb, I think there are three reasons. First, I believe that the uh, Bernard Madoff's firm was legit until well into 2001. I believe that as long as the major bull market the 20-year bull market between 1982 and, let us say, 2000, was on track, he was able to provide yields, the yields that he has promised, um, right on schedule and from real profits. So well into 2001, I believe his firm was totally legitimate, and in 1999 there was an SEC inspection. He, he uh, passed it with flying colors and so on. Second uh, point is that Ponzi schemes are very typical of most financial activity. Banks are Ponzi schemes. The social security is, Ponzi, is a Ponzi scheme. If, if the definition of a Ponzi scheme is paying f previous investors with the money gleaned from future investors, then literally everything in, in the financial sector is a kind of Ponzi scheme. So oh. this thin line, this gray area between proper p Ponzi schemes and legitimate Ponzi schemes, to put it this way, uh, fools a lot of uh, a lot of people. Mr. Schiff, and do you thirdly, agree with Mr. Vagnon's uh, definition of a Ponzi scheme? Sure. Actually, you know, he's, Madoff wasn't running the largest Ponzi scheme in the world. That honor belongs to the United States government. It runs a social security system based on the exact principles of a Ponzi scheme. In fact, our national debt is financed based on a Ponzi scheme. You know, the United States government Precisely. continues to go deeper into debt, and the way we pay off maturing bonds is we sell new bonds. And we, the way we pay interest on the existing debt is we have to borrow that. So it's all Ponzi schemes. But the thing is, it doesn't work when the governments do it any better than when private citizens do it. And, you know, what's likely to happen? You know what, what unraveled uh, the Murdoch m m the, uh, scam was that investors needed their money. Well, what's happening now? You have the Chinese that want to have an economic stimulus. A lot of our creditors want their money back, and they can't have it. If people stop lending Americans money, the U.S. government money, the whole system's going to fall apart, just like Madoff's scam. Uh, Margie Lindsay, you look a little disturbed there. What's your response to that? I think the big difference here is that th these people went into it and, and it wasn't defined as a Ponzi scheme. They, they went in thinking this was a legitimate <coughs> investment house. Um, that's a big difference than, than saying that this is, is something that they walked into with their eyes open. Surely, yes, okay, they made mistakes and they didn't do as much due diligence and there should have been some more oversight, but they weren't investing in a Ponzi scheme and it's, it's wrong. Sam Vaknin. Well, they didn't think they were, but, you know, of course, I think the fact that the SEC was there, it creates a lot of complacency. People assume, well, the government is regulating it. It must be legitimate. I think if we didn't have that SEC, I think the public would have been a lot more skeptical. There would have been a lot more private sector due diligence if we didn't have the government uh, supposedly looking out for us. Sam Vaknin, yeah, if I can sorry, put this sorry. point to you, a securities executive, Harry Markopoulos, complained to the SEC in May of 1999. He also wrote a letter about Madoff in 2005, saying that it was impossible for Madoff to have been making his money legally and that he should therefore be investigated. It seems almost ridiculous that nothing was done about it. Well, in 2003, Societe Generale sent a due diligence team to Madoff. They reached a conclusion that it was a Ponzi scheme. They placed place the entire outfit on their internal blacklist. That did not prevent numerous institutional investors working with Societe Generale from investing their money through Societe Generale with Ma Madoff and from complaining to the board of Societe Generale that the due diligence team must have been wrong and that they are over strict. People want to believe a very, a very important feature of Ponzi schemes is that, is that they are cultish. These are cults. 
people are recruited exactly you use the right word they are recruited through social networking they want to believe there is this fantasy what we call in psychology a shared psychosis so I don't buy I don't buy the story of poor we we didn't know what we were getting into 10% a year annual yield over the last 40 years and these people sophisticated savvy investors did not know what they were getting into give me a break Marjolinzi what's your response about that these people must have known what they were getting themselves into I think I agree with, with Sam. I think they deluded themselves into what they were getting into because it was too good to be true and they liked the idea of getting these, these constant returns. It is impossible to have that kind of flat return and, and positive return year after year after year. And it's their, basically it's their own fault for not digging deeper. But and you know, yes, if the, you have regulations, you should, should have been following them. Yeah, you know, it's very easy to, to believe in that. Look, you know, the whole housing bubble was another form of a Ponzi scheme where people kept buying houses and condos on the assumption that they would rise in value forever without any regard to rental income or, you know, you know any, any normal measure of, measure of valuation. The same dynamic happened with the dot-coms. I mean, you have these naturally occurring Ponzi schemes all the time where people believe what should be apparent nonsense. And the same thing applies, again, to the United States government, that people believe that our economy is viable. When it's financed based on a Ponzi scheme, when America just borrows money from the world and blows it on consumption, you have an entire world that actually thinks we're running a legitimate economy when we're no more legitimate than Madoff's uh, company was. Okay, well, it's time for a short break now. When we come back, we'll discuss the fallout from Madoff's scam on world markets in the midst of an already dire financial crisis. Stay with us. back. As the financial world grapples with an alleged fraud of up to $50 billion, the United States is hoping an interest rate cut will slow down the economic crisis. John Derrett reports on what this means for Wall Street. Shares on the New York Stock Exchange shot up on Tuesday after the U.S. Central Bank aggressively cut interest rates. The Federal Reserve's historic three-quarters of a percentage point cut sent Wall Street's main index, the Dow Industrials, soaring to close ahead by more than 4%. I think they're desperate to stimulate the economy. They're really worried about all the economic indicators. However, I don't really think it's going to do that much because the fact of the matter is 70% of our GDP is from consumer spending, but the consumers are already all tapped out. The rate cut, which is within striking distance of 0%, ensured the once mighty US dollar fell sharply on foreign exchange markets. The rate cut, designed to kick-start the ailing U.S. economy, came on a day of more grim data, showing just how bleak things are here. The headline rate of inflation saw its biggest monthly decline since records began, down 1.7 percent. The core rate, minus food and fuel, was unchanged. Also on Tuesday, the number of new housing projects begun fell by an equally sharp amount, and economists expect further steep drops in the future as builders walk away from projects. And former investment bank Goldman Sachs turned in a huge quarterly loss, its first since becoming a public company. Another terrible day of data on Wall Street in Lower Manhattan, and here in Upper Manhattan, the lack of oversight and the corruption that led to the global economic meltdown are also having their effect. This is Yeshiva University, one of many charities and foundations across the United States who trusted their money to the one-time Wall Street guru, Bernie Madoff. Madoff is the former Nasdaq stock market chairman who was arrested last week on securities fraud. He's accused of running a Ponzi or pyramid scheme, paying off one set of clients with money from another set. Yeshiva University, whose endowment was already down by several million dollars after turmoil in the stock markets, isn't the only institution affected. Elite Swiss banks, prominent billionaires, asset management companies and wealthy retirees have also lost millions of dollars. Outside the university, the students had mixed views. I mean, I think they just got greedy and it was a stupid decision. If something's too good to be true, it's too good to be true. It's sad to, to see people, someone deceive people like that, but, uh, but yeah, no. College will survive? Yeah, college will survive. The students may be confident their university will survive its unwise investment decision, but they must wonder what the world of work is going to look like when they finally get to graduate. John Terrett, Al Jazeera, New York. 
Well, we're still joined by our guests in Stamford, Connecticut, Peter Schiff and Scopy, Sam Vankin, and in London, Margie Lindsay. Uh, Peter Schiff, tell us a bit more about the scale of Madoff's crimes because the global list of victims just keeps on climbing, doesn't it? High-profile banks like HSBC, uh, Tokyo's Nomura Holdings, yeah. as well as wealthy individuals. I mean, this scandal is really being felt far beyond the U.S. Yeah, well, you know, he traveled in very exclusive circles, and the fact that it was so difficult to get money with him. I mean, people wanted to give him money, and he refused to take it. So it, it did have that, that atmosphere of exclusivity, cultishness, uh, uh, and, you know, people wanted to be in there. And you're getting these returns year after year. And sure, you know, in hindsight, you can look back and say people should have been very suspicious. But again, as I said earlier, you know, people believe when you're trapped in a bubble, whether it's in housing or Internet stocks or subprime mortgages, uh, people will accept false paradigms, and especially when there's a lot of people around you to validate what you're doing, uh, you know, y y you'll, get, you'll get suckered. And a, a lot of people are going to be in for a rude awakening all around the world for much bigger Ponzi schemes, as I said, going, being operated by the U.S. government. But, of course, as far as Wall Street's reputation, you know, uh, our reputation is already shattered in this country. We spread toxic mortgages all around the world. Uh, we're responsible for this crisis. We've basically bankrupted of people around the world who put their faith in U.S. institutions. And now, you know, here's another scandal. It's just another problem uh, that we're going to be dealing with here on Wall Street uh, for years to come. Sam Vankin, could there be more Bernie Madoffs out there that we don't know about? For sure there are. I have no doubt there are. In times of long bull runs where there is mass, mass psychosis, mass hysteria, hysteria, where cults develop, uh, where... Uh, fantasies flourish, where peer pressure forces people to consume, to spend, and so on, where, as, as Peter says correctly, the government itself engages in Ponzi scheme-type behaviors, where banks uh, lose, their, their, uh, lose any restraint, uh, behavioral or otherwise, where regulators fail regularly, and so on and so forth, there's for sure dozens of additional schemes simply undiscovered yet. Margie Lindsay, in some ways, this couldn't have come at a worse time given the current uh, credit crisis. How is this going to affect confidence in the banking sector? I don't think it's going to do them any good, certainly. Um, they already were reeling with the, the normal depositors thinking they couldn't keep their own money safe. Now, uh, these um, high net worth individuals, pension schemes and others who use a lot of these um, products, um, usually hedge funds with a wrapper around them with capital protection. I've done all the due diligence, say the bank. I don't think there's going to be a lot of trust now in anything that they say to their customers. Peter Schiff, a lot of people might expect banks to be taking less risk in the midst of the credit crisis. Will many people be wondering why the banks invested in this sort of scheme in the first place? Well, I mean, obviously they were duped. I mean, bank people have done a lot more foolish things, I suppose. Uh, but, you know, the government is encouraging all this excessive risk-taking. The government is force-feeding cheap credit uh, into the financial system and, and, and basically ordering them to make loans that they otherwise wouldn't be making. I mean, we this is a time where we need to be consolidating. We need to be cutting back on our consumption, especially uh, loans for people to consume. We need to be building up our savings. We need to act responsibly after a decade of irresponsibility that was fed uh, by reckless monetary policy, but now the U.S. government is doing the, the exact opposite. They're encouraging all this, and then they act surprised like something, when something like this happens when they basically encouraged it. I'd like to comment on that. First of all, um, it is wrong to cast the United States in the role of a villain, however tempting that is. Uh, European banks, for instance, are much more highly leveraged than American ba retail banks. European banks have enormous indebtedness, which I have no idea how they, they would uh, be able to pay back. Uh, many European banks, by any standard, are actually insolvent. But I would like to draw attention to some global, global trends that led us to this predicament. First of all is uh, the problem of the erosion of the middle class in many countries, especially in the United States, which led to net, uh, negative net savings or negative or low net savings and which force governments uh, to borrow the savings of other countries. The best example is, of course, or the worst example is, of course, the United States, which is consuming the savings of countries such as China and Japan and the Eurozone. Okay, well, we're so running out of time. So problem, and the um, second problem... And squandering it. Sorry? We're blowing it on consumption. We're not, you know, we can't pay the money back. That's the Ponzi dynamic. Margie, Lindsay, I want to come to yes, you yes, and pick course. up on a point that Peter Schiff made about a lack of responsibility. Is this story 
just as much about the limits or the failure of regulation and oversight as it is about the man himself and what he did because if people can mess with the system and get away with it well then that's exactly what they'll do May I interject it's hard for a second? until we know all the details of this we won't know sorry um, but I think the, the basic thing is if as one of the students said, if something looks too good, it probably isn't true. And people are greedy. It's their, their human nature. This guy was able to pull the wall over people's eyes. Certainly the SEC must look again at how its regulations are being enforced, what it's doing, and how it's protecting investors. And investors need to be a lot more smarter and a lot more cautious in the future. Sam Banken, I can see you're itching to say something, so... I'm always itching. Don't take me seriously. I, I, what I would like to add is, is this, globalization. We tend to ignore globalization. The, the global reach of financial intermediaries, such as banks and such as Bernard Madoff, this global reach made, uh, created a situation where regulation cannot be effective or was rendered ineffective. We don't have supranational regulators. We don't have cross-border effective regulation. We are, we are a globalized economy with localized regulators, hence the failure, or that's one of the big reasons for the failure. Peter Schiff, just one quick final word from you. It, it, it's not yet clear how much money was lost or, or how many people uh, may have been involved. Investigators are still piecing together what happened, but just how much damage has been done here? As I said, on the margin, I'm not sure. I think there's already been a lot of damage done. It's like, you know, we're down and this is, amounts to a kick in the groin. Uh, I certainly think to the extent that people become more skeptical, uh, are, are less likely to entrust money with, with other managers, if people try to withdraw their money, obviously it could create some problems uh, if, it, if it further erodes the, the confidence uh, in other financial institutions. But in many cases, uh, you know, the, people have too much confidence in, in these financial institutions. Uh, you know, you know, if you if you're going to go ice skating on thin ice, it doesn't do you any good if you believe the ice is sound when in fact it's thin. And so, in many cases, more skepticism of Wall Street is probably going to be a good thing. Okay, well, thanks very much indeed for joining us in Stamford, Connecticut, Peter Schiff, in Skopje, Sam Vankin, and in London, Margie Lindsay. And thank you so much for joining us here on this edition of Inside Story. We, of course, welcome your comments and suggestions. Please email them to us at insidestory at aljazeera.net. Bye for now. Thank you.